On this edition of Independent Sources, a call for the city's Department of Correction to end its cooperation with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. What we want to happen is for New York City to establish a bright line between the criminal legal system and the civil immigration system. And finding new jobs and bridging the digital divide. And we try and allow a candidate to show their true personalities because in these types of roles, personality is often much more important than exam results or other hard types of skills, which doesn't come through on a paper form. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The immigrant rights group Migrant Power Alliance is calling on Mayor Bill de Blasio to end the Department of Corrections practice of detainers or immigration holds. The group argues that holding immigrants beyond the time they would otherwise be released and then placed into custody for deportation robs them of the opportunity to acquire legal counsel. They also say that some immigrants are charged with minor crimes that don't warrant such harsh measures. I talked to immigration activist Abraham Paulus of Families for Freedom and Denise Romero of the Migrant Power Alliance about why they want this practice to end. Denise, let's start with you. What kind of crimes have these immigrants committed, and exactly who are these immigrants? Well, in New York City specifically, when you look at the way in which um, immigrants end up in detention centers, um, it's usually through the over-policing that's going on in New York City in general. Um, and we know that uh, policing in New York City has been questioned a lot for the, the racial profiling aspect of it. Uh, and we see that in, in the detentions that are happening because it's mostly black, it's mostly Latino. Um, and the difference is, is that when these Latinos getting over-policed and detained for very minor infractions, you know, just like trespassing, uh, being at the park a little too late, um, or, you know, just minor violations, um, they end up being detained, taken to the precinct, uh, and then sucked into a really broken immigration system. So when we're talking about who's being detained, um, who's being detained in New York City, it's very much people who have committed minor infractions or uh, minor crimes. Mm -hmm. And so what are you asking uh, what are you calling for exactly, uh, Abraham? Well, um, what we want to happen is for New York City to establish a bright line between the criminal legal system and the civil immigration system. And one way that New York City can be able to do this is by not honoring what is called a detainer. And just to explain what a detainer is, a detainer is a request from the immigration officials that basically says, hold this foreign-born person or this non-American citizen past their schedule release. When they would have been released by the criminal justice system anyways, uh, this hold says, okay, once they're done with this matter, the criminal matter, we would like to take custody over the person. Why do you have to extend their stay? I mean, why do you have to hold them longer? Why and is that's that what necessary? We're yeah. That's, I think that that's what our question is because um, a lot of these people, you know, commit very small um, violations and then do their time. Um, and, you know, the criminal justice system would have released them, but ICE has a detainer on them. And instead of being released, they're then taken to uh, another detention facility or to another room to wait for ICE to come and pick them up uh, and take them to a detention center. The New York City Council recently passed a, a, a bill that restricts some of the ways that uh, the police department can cooperate with ICE. Can you explain further? Right. The, uh, so the city council, first of all, you know, we want to applaud them for sort of addressing that this is an issue, right? And the way that they've sort of addressed it themselves is by passing two policies, one in 2011 and the other one in 2013. It's the most recent one. What these bills do is restrict, right, restrict uh, the damage that the detainer does or the hole does. And it says that if a person fits a certain criteria that New York City will not hand over these individuals to ICE. And what we're saying is that that criteria is way too cumbersome, way too complicated. And the best way to go at it is just by saying, look, this is a request. New York City is choosing who can get turned over to ICE and choosing who can't. And what we're saying is 
we should probably make the choice of saying we don't really need to honor these requests. Other cities have done the same. And so we think New York City should be a leader considering the reality, which is 60% of New Yorkers are either immigrants themselves or children of immigrants. You have a, a sort of a borough like Queens where 50% are foreign-born residents. So in a, in a city like New York City, um, I think that we need to come out with policies that actually reflect the reality and not with policies that only allow a certain minimum, right, a minority of people to be able to reunite with their families and reintegrate into society. To be clear, Denise, we're not talking about the same thing when a police officer interacts with an immigrant and then uh, uh, is, by law, is not allowed to call ICE or hand them over. It's after they've been through the system and they were arrested and they're about to get out, then they, ICE wants them hand over to them. Right. right, but even then, when we're talking about who ends up at Rikers, for example, um, you know, uh, my own younger brother um, was in Rikers, and the people who end up there have not committed serious crimes, mm -hmm. and that is why they stay at Rikers, but, you know, I still has a presence there. Um, and even though people are serving sentences of less than a year, um, you are right, they are serving a sentence for something that they've done or for something the uh, justice system thinks that they should do time for um, but those are not very serious or violent crimes since there are at Rikers so we're asking why is why does ICE why is that ICE allowed to have such a big presence um, and why is it that only a minority of immigrants who end up with detainers at Rikers can actually like Abe said reunite with their families and uh, fight their deportation cases. What happened to your brother? Um, well it's the same it's one of many stories in New York City. Again, you know, he just had a lot of contact with the police because of the over-policing of uh, immigrant neighborhoods. Um, I'm from Jackson Heights, Queens, uh, one of the biggest immigrant neighborhoods in the world. And uh, we have seen an overwhelming amount of policing increase in, in this neighborhood where we have cops, um, you know, patrolling every single street. And, you know, his in contact with the police is very constant. Um, and he, you know, had a series of trespass um, mm -hmm. violations. But when so a judge... So my, minor stuff. Right, very minor stuff. But in this case, did they try to uh, contact uh, immigration in any shape or form? Or? Well, he did. Um, he had... Uh, a very small sentence um, in, at Rikers and when he did his time he was set to be released and that's when he was informed that he wasn't going to be released and he, he was actually taken to another room to wait for um, ICE to get a hold of him and now we're talking about uh, someone who's less than 21 years old um, you know at Rikers prison and that's another thing that a lot of people uh, don't question enough and there isn't enough dialogue about it's also what happens inside of these places where you have um, young people who are under 21 being taken to detention centers um, and there isn't necessarily the resources to really uh, have them you know stay in in well-run facilities so uh, quickly, what happened to your brother? He was released and everything is fine. Oh. His case is still pending. Okay. Um, and we were able, uh, fortunately, to afford bond. Um, so he is actually at home. But then that's another thing that we are very worried about is that when uh, ICE goes into Rikers and takes uh, these immigrants, they're taken to private, privately run detention mm -hmm. centers that are actually out of state and that they're unable to Community get in contact family. with their family. Um, ourselves, we were unable to visit at him when he was in New Jersey because of some of the policies um, that these detention centers have and um, and so you know fortunately we were able to afford bond but that's not the case for many immigrants sure. who are working class or who don't even have family here and are unable to contact anyone or even have any access to legal representation that's a real powerful real, real anecdote now Abraham have you guys been able to quantify the the, the scope of this situation how many people are uh, caught in this dragnet well I mean I think the numbers that we, we have uh, right now um, we're talking about thousands of New Yorkers on a yearly basis so from October 2012 to September 2013 I think the numbers around 3,000 um, of those only 25 percent were able to go back and to uh, reunite with their families um, then we have sort of the the new bill that had passed in 2013 and so that's gone in effect in the last three months 
So in the last three months, we're really looking at a little bit of uh, over 500 um, uh, New York residents that uh, have a detainer on them. Um, and about 37% of those New York residents were able to reunite with the family, where the city administration had said, uh, you're OK to reunite with your family, but you're, you're not, right? Unfortunately, we're out of time. Dennis Romero, Abraham Paulus, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for having us on. When we come back, a tech company gives new meaning to the term job application. Before that, Abby Ishula has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. From El Diario La Prensa, pro-immigrant groups want the de Blasio administration to improve working conditions for day laborers. Valeria Trevez, executive director of New Immigrant Community Empowerment, or NICE, is planning to team up with members of other immigrant organizations to request city funding to build more centers for day laborers. The centers would act as a mediator for employers and day laborers to protect workers from unfair working conditions, such as low wages and wage theft. There are currently three centers in the city for day laborers, but activists argue that they aren't enough to serve the thousands of workers across New York. Voices of New York also covered news on immigrant workers. The Center for the Biology of Natural Systems at Queens College and the immigration activist group Make the Road New York will train 20 construction workers as safety and health hazard specialists. These specialists will use smartphones and a special mobile app to evaluate and record any risk factors on job sites. 500 other construction workers were given protective equipment and trained solely on workplace safety. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, a division of the Centers for Disease Control, granted over $500,000 to make the program possible. The Brooklyn Bureau takes an in-depth look at one of the city's early childhood learning programs and finds that it's come up short of its goal. The Early Learn NYC program was set up to raise education standards and family support for children from birth to age five from low-income households. But in Bedford-Stuyvesant, for example, there are about seven eligible children for every available slot. The rate is even more disproportionate citywide. Wine shop owners in Fort Greene and Clinton Hill, Brooklyn, are feeling squeezed by competition. The NABE reports that there's been an explosion of wine shops popping up in the surrounding areas with almost a dozen openings since 2004. Many shop owners are complaining about new shops opening in close proximity with similar wine offerings. One owner even went to the State Liquor Authority to oppose the opening of a competitor's store. And finally, the owner of Boing Boing Breastfeeding Boutique in Park Slope has been overwhelmed by support from the community after news broke that she may be forced to close. DNAinfo.com reports that after Karen Pepperno wrote an article for the Huffington Post about her business struggles, she received countless donations and offerings from people to volunteer to help her market and promote her shop. Park Slope Parents blog founder Susan Fox called Paperno the unsung hero of the neighborhood and urged her 5,000 members to donate $10. Paperno opened the shop 17 years ago and has since offered baby products and resources to moms struggling to breastfeed. Paperno says she may launch a fundraising campaign to raise up to $20,000 to put the store on a profitable path. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent Sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. It's not news that finding a job is hard these days. The latest Labor Department figures put unemployment in New York City at just under 9%. That's more than the national average of 7%. What's making job searches even more complicated is that more of them are happening online, making the paper resume virtually obsolete. It also leaves many lower income city residents who may not have internet access stranded on the far side of the digital divide. The tech company Aploy is addressing this need with their Job45 program. I spoke to Aploy CEO Adam Lewis about the initiative. Adam, tell us about Aploy. What is it exactly? So Aploy is an um, easy way for people to find jobs and for companies to find the best people. So if you think about um, hiring, especially in the retail, hospitality types of jobs, it stayed the same for many, many years. You know, if you want to get a job in a store, you'll probably find yourself lining up at a store. You know, they have these things called open calls where they'll say, if you want a job at this store, 
come along on such and such a day and you're waiting in line filling out a paper form. Mm -hmm. Then you get a five minute slot with an assistant manager and they make decisions based on who they meet that day. Lots of people, lots of waiting, really poor candidate experience and, and probably for the company, they're not able to find the best candidates. So what we saw was a way to create this dialogue, this interactivity on a mobile device. You might be surprised to hear that less than 3% of Fortune 500 companies have any way that a candidate can apply to a job from a mobile device. And if you think about the demographic of people that are applying to these types of jobs, they don't have access to computers. I mean, there's over 100 million Americans. One in five Americans don't have internet access at home. So we feel that the, the way to create that access and to bring people to companies in a much more efficient way is through a mobile job application that's interactive. When we thought about what is the application? Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, you, you say interactive. How does it work exactly, the, the, the technical aspect of it? So there are two main components to the application itself. The first part of it is standardized. So it will be the same for every application the candidate goes through. So if you think about now, every time you complete a paper form, you're filling out the same information about your background, your educational, personal details. Once a candidate goes through a ploy, they can swipe through that for every application they go for. So it makes it much, much easier for the candidate not having to enter that same information every time. But a second part of the application is interactive. So, and we try and allow a candidate to show their true personalities because in these types of roles, personality is often much more important than exam results or other hard types of skills, which doesn't come through on a paper form. So they can look on their device and they can hear, for example, a disgruntled customer shouting at the candidate because the machines are broken. And then it flicks back a video for the candidate to have to respond to that customer. So immediately the company can see how will that person respond to our customers? How will they represent our brand? Which if you think about a black and white form, doesn't show anything to do with personality or commitment or loyalty, which are the key character traits for these types of jobs. Okay, and, and so, you know, let's say I'm unemployed and I'm looking for a job. How do I know about employ and how do I get to use it? Where do I go? So candidates are already downloading our app, which they can do from their own mobile device, their tablets or their phones. But we also see a very important piece of this is actually installing iPad kiosks in public places. So I mentioned before the many, many Americans that don't have internet access and therefore don't have access to apply to jobs. Mm -hmm. So we're partnering with community centers, um, with shelters, with welfare providers, and we're actually installing our iPad kiosks at their locations. So people come to these, these places and they can actually directly from there apply to the jobs. Now in New York City, uh, where can we find some of these kiosks? And we're working with America Works in New York, um, in Manhattan and in Brooklyn. We've actually just installed 12 kiosks in each center, and we're about to kind of take that across the U.S. with them. They, they're, they're contracted with the New York City directly as well as federal government. And people who need access want an innovative way to be able to show their personalities to come at the center and apply. So that's, that's something we've just kind of rolled out at the end of 2013, and we're going to be pushing this out further during this year. Well, my next question is how successful is a, a ploy and how is, how is business for you? It's going really well. I mean, we, st we launched this six months ago, and since then, we've got hundreds of jobs up on the app. You know, I really would advise people who are looking for jobs, particularly in the East Coast, which is where we've started to kind of download the app. There's hundreds of jobs every week, you know, being put up onto the app, and we're getting a lot of job seekers finding us, you know, uh, and applying to jobs through it. So what we're trying to track now as well is once someone gets a job, how successful are they? Because obviously that will show companies that the, there is a big difference, being able to just to see a candidate on a paper form or just meet them in two minutes actually to actually see them in a ploy and really understand their character and have um, a real quantifiable, quantifiable way of measuring how successful a candidate will be. The, the other thing that we're trying to do which is actually important is we're trying to um, not only have an app but create a bit of an ecosystem around the app. So what's very important for us is to train and upskill people um, to help them get a job but then also try and help them progress through the job. So, you know, they start like an, an hourly position. How can they then learn skills to get into a management position and beyond? So within Aploy, both on the app itself and on the web, we're creating daily content that gives them training advice. Um, we have experts from, from all different fields where they're giving video content. There's, there's um, live streams where these types of people who don't necessarily have formal training can get trained and really find how they can navigate through, number one, the job search, but then how they can progress in their careers through the app itself. On our app, as soon as you open up the app, it lists all the jobs that are closest to me right now. So I could be standing on Fifth Avenue and you know I want to know which stores are hiring. I open up the app 
and it will show me which stores are closest to me that have, that have positions. Because obviously someone who's going for an hourly position doesn't, doesn't want to be traveling to the other side of New York for an hourly position. So it will show me on a map, as well as a list, where I can get that job, yeah. which is very, very exciting. And what, what they can also do is follow companies. So let's say, for example, a job seeker wants to kind of follow uh, Starbucks. When there's a Starbucks opening on the app, it will actually push notify their phones to say, this store near you is actually hiring, come in and see it. Can you expand on that much more on sort of how a prospective job applicant can tailor made this, this app for their needs? Right, so I think that, um, you know, you mentioned interactive before, and that, that's very important for us because it's a two-way dialogue. You know, applying for a job, you know, often, you know, you hear one of the biggest upsets a candidate has, they, they send off a resume somewhere, the black goes hole. into the black hole, don't hear it, just don't hear back. So with what we're trying to create is a real kind of interaction between companies and candidates. So, you know, I mentioned um, you can follow companies. What we're doing on, on, our, on our observer side, where we're actually trying to kind of create content, is actually look, dig deep into different types of companies. What's the culture like to work in different types of companies? What are the hours like? What's the team like? So that when candidates come and look at different jobs they want to apply for, they actually really get a better understanding than just a four or five line description, you know, you'll be doing this, this, and this. You actually understand what you're going to be getting your, you know, into as a, as a job. Because at the end of the day, we need to, the candidates to enjoy their job and make sure that's the right place for them. And I think, importantly, um, it is very location-based. So we kind of blend like geolocation services with push notifications to, number one, you know, identify which jobs are closest to that candidate and make sure that they you know, apply to a job that they can actually get to in the morning but then also push notify to make that communication instant. You know, we don't want them to have to wait for, for two weeks for, for, an, for an email. If the job's not right for them, you know, let them know straight away, let them move on. And I think a lot of our companies that are working with us actually see that as a big advantage. Because, you know, if you think about a retail company, nine out of 10 candidates are not gonna get a job. How can that retail company make sure that those nine people stay as customers of that brand? Because at the end of the day, they, they don't want to give them such a terrible experience. They can say, I'm not gonna go back there. So with this, they can actually say, you know, we don't have the right job for you right now, but here are other jobs, here are other opportunities, here's other types of content that you can get through Apply, and it just makes the canned experience much, much more positive. So basically, Apply is more than just an app, it's a technical HR. I mean, really, it's an ecosystem, it's a community. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's very engaging on, from, from all different sides of, of the coin, you know, from community centers, from cities, Another thing we're trying to do right now is work with malls, um, with malls, okay. shopping malls, okay. um, because we are, we see that obviously a lot of stores in these in these centres. We thought we we'd actually put our iPad kiosks in non-revenue generating space, so that customers, shoppers, can actually you know come up and actually find jobs and easily apply through the iPad rather than having to go from store to store. That's really great for the companies and also obviously a much much better experience for the candidates. Well, good luck. Thank you, Adam Lewis. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Still up on the show, bringing affordable health care to East Harlem. Finally from us, the Affordable Care Act, more commonly known as Obamacare, has been lauded for providing health insurance coverage for 40 million Americans who are currently uninsured and lambasted for having an inefficient website and being overpriced. One of the underreported aspects of the law is the provision for funding community organizations like Borinquen Neighborhood Health Center in Spanish Harlem. Judith Escalona tells us more about how the center has benefited from Obamacare. This is Maria Delgado, please call extension 218. Barica Neighborhood Health Center has been serving East Harlem since 1974, delivering affordable health care to one of New York City's neediest communities. We have a mission here to provide top quality health care at little cost or no cost. We never turn away a patient. I don't think any community health center uh, that I know of that's in, in business today turns away people. 
It's estimated that more than half of the area's 120,000 residents live below the poverty line. East Harlem also has the highest concentration of people living with AIDS in the city and the highest rate of hospitalization for pediatric asthma in the nation. The area is predominantly Hispanic with a large immigrant population from Mexico and parts of Africa. If their income status is such that all they can afford to pay is $10, $15, well, that's what they pay. We provide all the health care, but we go the extra step. And what are those extra steps that you're not going to get in any hospital setting? If a mother comes here in the winter and she doesn't have a coat on, but her children do, but she can't afford to buy a coat, you could be sure that she will not leave this clinic without a coat. Undocumented immigrants also receive care without regard to their ability to pay. We have to take care of our undocumented uh, people that come to this country because all of us better take a really good look at how we are arrived here. The health center currently operates out of Taino Towers, a low-income housing complex on 3rd Avenue and 123rd Street. This fall, Boriken will move into their own building across the street. That was made possible by the Affordable Health Care Act. In 2010, when the federal legislation was approved, Boriken was awarded $12 million in capital funds. If we had not received Affordable Care Act dollars, we would not be able to have built a new clinic. We have been trying to raise uh, monies for almost 14 years to be able to build a new clinic and thereby expand services. The Affordable Care Act is not perfect. It has made a good impact on this community health center. We'll be able to hire specialty doctors, for instance, we didn't have a cardiologist. We now hired a cardiologist. We hired a podiatrist. We have ophthalmology that's coming into the new clinic. We're going from one and a half floor of clinic space to five floors, four which will be utilized to provide services to the community. The building is the first green primary care center in New York City. It's energy saving and is constructed with non-toxic and allergen free materials. Through its program targeting small community based clinics, the Affordable Health Care Act also provided funding for Boring Ken's daily operations. We're bilingual, bicultural, we offer every language. We have a language bank for anyone that comes in the community because the community is changing. It's not just a Latin community anymore. Um, and all of this has been possible because of the Affordable Care Act. Ellie Sanchez is optimistic about the future. With immigration reform pending, she anticipates additional benefits to the East Harlem community, especially its undocumented members. Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.